applicant in the Appalachian region, offering a unique personal perspective to the course. In this course, we are learning about Appalachia by looking into the history, economics, environment, and folklore of the region. We have learned about how the region is defined, Native Americans' history in the region, coal mining, the war on poverty, tourism, and even attended the annual FSU Appalachian Festival. This class is normally offered in person, but due to the pandemic, we have shifted to meeting completely online through Microsoft Teams. Despite being online, we have still managed to continue learning, collaborating, and having discussions, all of which are key to getting the full experience of taking this course. Our community partner this year was the Evergreen Heritage Center, and having had the opportunity to visit the Evergreen Heritage Center earlier this semester, I can say from my experience that the Evergreen Heritage Center is truly a very unique and special place. Located in Mount Savage, Maryland, the 130-acre historic farm is used as an outdoor classroom. I got the opportunity to tour the Evergreen House Museum that was originally built in 1780 as a log cabin was expanded into a six bedroom Victorian mansion sometime around 1870. Since 1993, it has been used as a museum that seems as though it is frozen in time with period correct attributes as well as family artifacts that have been recovered and put on display in the home. During my visit, I was also granted the opportunity to tour the Evergreen Barn. Built sometime in the 1780s it is the only 18th century barn left standing in Western Maryland. Inside you can see the craftsmanship and pride that went into constructing this barn and its hand-hewn chestnut, chestnut beams. In the lower portion of the barn, the Evergreen Heritage Center has also constructed an agricultural, oh, oh, sorry, an agricultural history museum that contains artifacts from early farming, as well as abundance of information describing the usage of each tool. Uh, this year to complement the Evergreen Heritage Center's new Appalachian kitchen, we were asked by a community partner to research the use of five crops in Appalachia. These crops selected for our research were potatoes, tomatoes, corn, green beans, and apples. In addition to those five crops, we, were, we also chose to provide information on wild mushrooms, grapes, wild berries, sassafras, and pears. Our research was supposed to encompass the time frame of the Civil War up until the First World War. We were, at, we were tasked with providing information on how these crops were grown during the time period, how they, how they were affected by the weather, any financial events or any evolving industrialization, and what recipes that required these crops as ingredients were popular during the time period. With the unfortunate event of the pandemic, the Evergreen Heritage Center has had to readjust their programming and were unable to host workshops, which were scheduled for the fall. To combat this setback, we were also tasked with creating a podcast featuring this information, as well as finding two historic images to feature with our research in order to generate interest in these workshops, which will be held when it is safe to do so. Hi, I'm Taylor. I'm sorry you can't see me. I don't have a working camera on my laptop. Um, now we would like to begin sharing information on the food sources we have researched. Starting with potatoes in Appalachia, a potato is one of the most broadly refined vegetables. They are starchy underground growers included in the family of nightshades. As well as potatoes, the nightshade family includes tomatoes, eggplant, red peppers, and green peppers. Astonishingly, there are approximately 2,000 kinds of potatoes. However, only about eight of those kinds are refined internationally. The potato production rate in the United States is fourth, placing after corn, rice, and wheat. The first potatoes were founded in the Andes Mountains of South America. The potatoes were brought to Appalachia by European settlers during the 18th century. Potatoes became a staple crop in Northern Europe around 1815, and they were used as a food reserve during the wars. The potatoes were native to the Americas, but for most Americans, the potatoes were reintroduced by the European settlers. The North American endorsement of the potato determined the arrangement of agriculture in the Appalachian area. 
Using the potato as an extensive farming product, we began to use the potatoes in many different ways. There are several various ways to eat potatoes. Still, the most popular methods in Appalachia include potato soup, potato candy, and fried potatoes, which just to name a few can be eaten as french fries, home fries, or potato cakes. Grapes age back thousands of years and have been prominent in many agricultures across the world. In Appalachia, the agriculture is much different compared to others. Due to temperature and humidity, the grapes in Appalachia are much different. They are known as native North American grapes and are hardier than other species of grapes, making them better for regular consumption. Grapes grown at the Evergreen and many areas in Appalachia are best known for this or are perfect to be used for things like jelly. These grapes are not ideal for things like winemaking, but growers today have taken on the challenge. Winemaking is a new frontier of grape agriculture in Appalachia and growers have done their best to make the process sustainable and organic. But this process is difficult due to the resources to make them perfect for winemaking. To make this whole process sustainable and organic, growers have had to come up with alternatives to pesticides like raising certain birds in the vineyards to control pests that will eat the plants to using solar energy. So in my research, I focused on apples and the history of orchards and nurseries in Appalachia. And these are some important questions about apples that I'd like to provide some answers for. So one of the most important factors of the apples growth here in Appalachia was the diverse climate of the mountains. So the different elevations were great for uh, growing different varieties of apples, because if, if you didn't know, there's actually like, I think there's over 130 different varieties of apples that are grown in the area, um, and they were used for different purposes. Uh, so the first person to realize this and share the knowledge openly with uh, other people in Appalachia was Jarvis Van Buren. Um, in the 1860s, Van Buren taught fellow citizens of his home state of Georgia about how to effectively grow their de desired varieties, both for personal consumption and economic benefit. Um, so over time, apples have become a large part of Appalachian culture, tradition, and cuisine. For example, throughout Appalachia, there are festivals to celebrate the crop and the culture it provides. One such festival is the Apple Blossom Festival in Virginia, which has been around since 1927. Other traditions include the family recipes that are passed down through generations, such as apple stack cakes and apple pie moonshine, which to me is an interesting combination of two different Appalachian staples, the moonshine and the apple pie. Um, people have also even thrown parties specifically to make large quantities of family favorite apple butters over the years. Hello, I uh, did uh corn in Appalachia, um, which has had quite an interesting history, both in its upbringings into the region of Appalachia, as well as its uh, historic widespread usages uh, in most products. Um, cultivated originally in central Mexico, roughly 7,000 years ago, it quickly spread through both regions of North America and South America, with North American Native Americans showing their techniques to the first colonists who utilized corn for their survival of the first winters. Uh, corn has been utilized in Appalachia specifically as a source of cooking for making alcohol and for creating toys. Um, within Appalachia, corn serves as a key ingredient in cooking, whether it's grounded into powder or just cooked whole. There were many different recipes that can include corn. Uh, from the usage of cornmeal and making um, such popular items like cornbread or corn pone to just eating it off the cob uh, or even cooking the kernels to make popcorn, uh, the usages of corn and cooking were limitless. Um, when creating alcoholic beverages, which was very popular uh, and still is, uh, corn was used primarily in Appalachian to make moonshine. Uh, this history of moonshine can date back to the Scottish and Northern Irish that produced whiskey back in the United Kingdom uh, when they left the UK and brought over and were brought over to the new land. They brought over their techniques and love for the craft 
uh, and started to produce moonshine in order to keep afloat in this new in these new economies. Uh, corn also served as a minor usage uh, for creating toys, uh, as there have been uh, documents where uh, corn husks uh, have been used to make dolls that um, little children have played with. For many years, mushrooms have been very popular throughout the Appalachia region. They were cultivated in the United States in 1865. There are many different types of species of mushrooms and they each have different qualities as well as objectives. Most of them are used as food and in some cases medicine. If not prepared properly, they are dangerous and many are extremely poisonous. Also, just a fair warning, only about 20 species of mushrooms taste good. You can either farm them yourself or you can go foraging. Foraging is very popular and when it comes to mushrooms, is even considered a sport in some areas. Mushrooms are very unique, especially in the Appalachian Mountains. During this pandemic, it has changed the lives of everyone and has made us adapt to a new lifestyle. While being in the middle of this pandemic, many things can come as obstacles and impact the way we collaborate. One of the most challenging parts of this is that we were only able to meet in person once at the Evergreen Heritage Center, and most of our communication has been via email. Unfortunately, this has made coordination with our partner more challenging. Along with the shortened semester, we haven't had as much time as we usually would to share our results with them and get feedback. The podcast created by us students over the duration of the semester will serve as excellent teaching aids for the Evergreen Heritage Center here in Western Maryland. Unfortunately, we don't have any completed podcasts to share with you today, but we'd be happy to share our final products with you once they are all finished. Upon completion, the Evergreen can allow open access of these podcasts through their website and can even use them as part of interactive learning experiences on the site to expand the knowledge of users on the subjects of Appalachian food, history, and culture. To close, we'd like to say thank you to the Evergreen Heritage Center for allowing us students to collaborate with them on this project, and a huge thanks to the Appalachian Regional Commission, East Tennessee State University, and all of the other schools that participated in this conference for allowing us to share our experiences and findings with you all.